Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are joined today by Professor Tony Bolden, who's Associate Professor of African and African American Studies at the University of Kansas. His teaching and research interests include a broad spectrum of topics related to artistic expression in the African diaspora, especially Black music and literature. He is the author of Afro Blue, Improvisations in African American Poetry and Culture, published by University of Illinois Press, 2004, and the just published Groove Theory, The Blues Foundation of Funk, which was published in uh, late 2020 by the University Press of Mississippi of Groove Theory. Our good friend Guthrie P. Ramsey writes, Tony Bolden takes his readers to the bridge and drops them off into some funk. How you doing, brother? Good to see you. Good to talk to you. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. This is a big deal, so I appreciate it. I know this has been a long project of love for you. Um, so let's talk about, you know, because when folks think about Tony Bolden's work, they obviously think about your work in literature and poetics. Um, what brings you to the funk? Well, actually, it was the literature. So, okay, so, you know, in terms of the critical sort of thing. But that was the music, you know, of my generation. So my relationship to funk um, is on the dance floor. And, um, you know, I stayed in the club so long, I saw the dancers come back. And, um, you know, but in after I finished um, Afro Blue, um, I realized that a number of writers had mentioned funk in different ways. There were certain images, uh, Ralph Ellison, I mentioned him in Groove Theory, Gail Jones, um, a number of writers. And as a jazz buff, I knew that, you know, the, the musicians of the 50s and the 60s, the hard bop musicians, basically called their music funk. And so I became interested in, in, you know, I realized that there was something else going on and I wanted to figure out what that was, what that was about. So, you know, you give us a really long trajectory of thinking about folk music, right? You know, you, you to, to bring it in conversation with the blues in ways that I don't think we've seen before. Um, so talk a little bit about the interrelatedness between funk music or the idea of funk and, and the blues and the idea of the blues. Sure. Well, so, you know, I came up as an intellectual in, in the Deep South. So I actually saw live blues club when, you know, played for Black folk, both in New Orleans and in the country, you know, when I was at Alabama. So I could see certain connections, you know, that way. Um, and also, you know, a lot of those old musicians, um, you know, when you start reading about, you know, blues culture, you can see there are certain references to it. Uh, for example, in blues, blue, in um, groove theory, you know, I point out that Bessie Smith, you know, said, you know, the, fun the funk is flying. That's what, 19... 25 when she makes that statement. In rural Mississippi, there's the Funky Five, you know, sort of, you know, picnic area where people play. So, you know, um, it was clear that, you know, that this concept, and I really approach it, as you, as you point out, I, I approach it as a concept, as opposed to, as, a, as an aesthetic, as a cultural aesthetic, you know, rather than, you know, only, um, you know, the, the music, you know, Nick called funk itself. Yeah, you, you tell a story early in the book about listening to music uh, with an uncle. Um, and, and even in your just mentioning how movement was such an interesting way for you to think about funk music, I, I, I found it striking, you know, to read early in the book, you know, your references to my colleague Tommy DeFrance, 
um, and his great work on, on music and, and the word kinetics, right? Kinesiology comes up over and over again. Um, talk a little bit about this concept of funk as movement. And, and I want to think, you know, a, a little outside the box here, you know, both in terms of what it looks like in the dance floor, right? Because I, I think we all understand funky. What's up, y'all? It, it is a relationship to movement, but but we don't actually really talk about what's happening in these dance floor spaces. Um, but also the way that funk as movement becomes a metaphor for thinking about movement in other ways, you know, particularly in the social context. Sure. Well, you know, um, movement, a lot of the musicians talk about the importance of movement in music making, right? So, you know, um, you know, I, I think of the funk, you know, the funk principle as the interplay between motion and emotion. Uh, now, if you and your cats can put down something hard like that, we might admit you to the heavenly society of musicians and composers. Hold tight, Bucky, old boy. You ain't heard nothing yet. Dizzy Gillespie said, um, you know, you, you've got to, you know, it's not just about studying the instrument. Right. You, you know, your musician has to move properly when they play my music, not just, um, you know, not just move, not, you know, you have to move properly. And he talked about, you know, Thelonious Monk and Illinois Jacquette. Um, so that that's one way. Um, Muddy Waters talked about the importance of of feeling well you know people just you know people can't just play play my music any kind of way it, you know it's, it's really hard because i make them up you know 18, 14 <laughs> different numbers right so so the importance of feeling there's a photograph in the book of a homemade uh blues guitar probably close to you know 1900 you know something like that and it has actually another of your colleagues, right, Richard Powell. Powell. So yeah. in, in Blues and Modernism, that's where I saw this the first time. And um, it has heart-shaped holes. And so clearly it's like a face. So a number of these people have talked about this across genres, uh, Michelle and Dege Ocello, um, you know, who grow for people who don't know, she played go-go um, early in her, her career. This is where she sort of developed. She talks about uh, keying into a dancer on the floor, you know, in, in terms of, you know, playing, you know, the right sound. Uh, Marshall Jones, the bass player for the Ohio Players, said exactly the same thing. So, in terms of music making, this is really serious. Now, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, another dimension. One of the things that really drew me to this concept that I think is really important for us to know this sort of, uh, or really get to and, and talk about is uh, the philosophical aspect or the epistemological aspect of it, which is sort of, you know, implied in that photo um, but one of the, the, the stigmas and the stereotypes that was related to the term and to black folk generally was that we have, you know, we're just sensual, right? You know, and that we don't think and that we're, an, you know, it's anti, anti so the whole mind body split. And for years we have bought into this idea that we have to go to you know, Europe to find out that this isn't true. Right. And these old blues musicians understood this. They didn't write peer review articles about it, <laughs> right? You know, but this was a work a day principle for them. It was a prerequisite for music making. Um, and so, you know, the, the, what I really am trying to get to is a black cultural philosophy. And then there are certain other characteristics of funk music, it's contrarianism that I think speaks to the political dynamics of the moment that we're facing. And we can, we want to, we can talk about that too, but I just wanted to answer your question. 
Yeah, I want to go back to that feeling piece. Um, you know, on, on a t- couple of levels. One, you know, you, you ground this book in the idea of thinking of musicians, black musicians, as organic intellectuals, right? And and you know, we we've heard that talked about in all kinds of ways, and, and very often it's been talked about in a way in which we make musicians legible in the world of intellectuals, right? In terms of what they think about, you know, I, you know, I think about the, the great bassist from the 1950s. We often think about in the context of him talking about politics, right? Um, in, in oh, a Charles case, Mingus. Charlie, Charlie Mingus, Charles yeah. Mingus, right? And so we recognize organic mus- you know, musicians sure. to the extent that they're legible to us in the sense of what we think of as intellectual work, right, or creative work. Exactly. Um, but you do so in t- really talking about thinking about feeling as an intellectual node. One, two, three, four. So when you talk about James Brown and the innovation, right, which is clearly a theoretical innovation as much as artistic on the one, and, and he can't articulate that. Right. You know, all he could do yeah. is tell the band, you know, I need an accent on this one and this three. Right. right? Or in the conversation he's having with the record guy who's like, why would you call it Poppers a brand new bag? It's like, because this is an innovation and I can't tell yes. you in ways that you understand why. Yes. But just listen to this. Yes. He says that this was a choreograph, it, you know, that he thought of the music as a choreograph, people don't really, you know, it's important to, you know, foreground the fact that he led that band as a dancer, you know, and that punk music was, you know, sort of, you know, that he was an architect of punk as as a dancer. He conceptualized this rhythmic innovation, you know, as as a dancer. So, you know, I think, you know, again, it, you know, the whole thing about feeling as as a, a mode of, of, as an epistemological mode. I, th- I think that this really should be, you know, at least a centerpiece of, of black studies. This was clearly what, you know, the, 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 the ancestors were about. I, I actually see funk as essentially, at least in terms of precepts, the characteristics, uh, the principles as uh, very much related to the musical values of the ring shout. Yeah. Worshiping the spirit, um, you know, and it was a sense of morality. And of course, you know, people were looking at that, you know, from without and they were saying, well, you know, this is, this is this is sacrilegious. This is this is this is evil, you know, and I'm worshiping God, right? You know, <laughs> what, what's wrong with you? Right? You know, but yeah, so I think, and I, I the other thing about this that I think is important is that this music that it, it, that is at this it's at the point of post, you know, right after the civil the, the voting rights act is passed that, you know, the music is created at this time. I like to think of this, this sort of, you were talking about feeling and the freedom to express that freedom, to express that feeling rather. Um, I see this as sort of the vernacular or working class uh, response to the black is beautiful cries, Mm. you know, for years, they, you know, the, the term existed, but you weren't supposed to say it. Right. But, you know, so they say, well, black is beautiful. Well, yeah, okay, well, you know, <laughs> that that then gets transposed, you know, into this term and then they, they then interpret because it really comes out of the dancers. Uh, the Funky Broadway was a dance right. before right. it was a song. Right. Funky you know? chicken. Yeah, all of that. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, but that comes about at that time. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you mentioned the freedom of the moment, and, and there's no way to talk about the freedom in that moment without talking about Slot Stone. Uh, and, and that's a big chapter <laughs> in this book for you. Baby, can't you rest?
And, and I think there's many ways, you know, more than 50 years later from the time that Sly comes on the, on the scene, I think there's a way, one, that he's never gotten his due mm-hmm. musically. Uh, I, I mean, because he burned so fast for a short period of time, sure. it, it gets forgotten. Um, but you can't really understand Prince without understanding Sly. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and a whole hun- a host of artists who come in some ways you can't think about Michael without thinking about Sly. Then we always think about Michael in the context of Jackie and James, right. you know, yeah. Sly, Sly, particularly the performativity of Sly on stage is an important piece. Um, tell me a little bit, talk a little bit about why Sly Stone is important, you know, in conceptualizing funk and, and more broadly to the black musical tradition. Well, um, you know, thank you. You know, uh, you, you you had a really important essay on on Sly Stone in a in a certain certain book, man. Um, well, I see Stone as in terms of the aesthetic, the things that we uh, associate with with funk. So it's contrarianism. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fundamentally rebellious. Today, people talk about, you know, protest, and I understand protest. Um, But there's a difference between protest and resistance. A lot of times the two get, uh, you know, conflated, right? So I like to say, in practical term, protest is what we oppose. Resistance is what we propose. And so, you know, Sly Stone, you know, epitomizes that kind of resistance, um, the kind of alterity. So in terms of his values, you know, he, he's talking about love. We've been talking about black love recently. So he's talking about Love City in 1968. Yeah. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, the, the, the bohemianism, um, even in terms of the mothership, he says, you know, I, I wanna take you higher. Uh, all of so many of the the, the metaphors. The you know even in terms of the musicianship, um, there are a number of different ways, and of course uh, I think of um, Maurice White's um, autobiography, where he says. Um, there was music before and music after Sly Stone. Um, and then in Tume, um, you know, said once at, at, a, at a conference that I, um, you know, incorporated into the book that he had worked with, or that he had known three, three geniuses. One was Miles Davis with whom he played. I don't remember the other one, but Sly Stone was among those three. Um, so he's really important. And, uh, you know, he has, this is the 50th um, anniversary of There's a Riot Going On. I'm hoping yeah. we can begin to do something, you know, to, to celebrate that. Yeah. You spent a chapter on Chaka Khan, um, you know, and again, she's someone who I think is given short shrift, um, obviously in relationship to funk, you know, which is where you to her, but more generally in terms of when we think about great Black women vocalists, you know, of the last 50 years or so, um, there are a couple of things I was struck by, some of which I knew, um, you know, the way that we read the Black musical tradition, particularly the vocalist tradition through the Black church, right, and and her experiences disrupt that, right, because she she didn't grow up in that space, right, with her group, with her sister, and then her trajectory. Um, The other piece that I just, you know, just made me chuckle is to think about, you know, what's going on in Chicago where you got, you know, Chaka Khan and Yvonne Khan, and then you got the Hutchinson sisters, right? You know, all all going back and forth and, 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 you know, really pushing each other forward. I will love you anyway, even if you cannot stay. Yes. You know, in ways that by the time, you know, we hear, you know, Best of My Love, you know, in 1977, and the both of them are really at the top of their form, right? You know, you understand how important those cutting sessions were, you know, a decade earlier. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, 
Well, you know, the book, what I'm trying to do in the book is, and I'm going to get to Chaka Khan, but she's, you know, part of this. So the question I'm asking, you know, is how is it that the music ultimately is called, you know, why is this term, right, yeah. you, know, um, you know, used? And then from there, who were the people who, were instrumental, like, you know, and how do I give credit for, you know, to these people who laid this, this foundation? And I wanted to, you know, sort of, you know, provide readers with, you know, four, three or four different sort of, you know, trajectories of the aesthetic. So with Chaka Khan, the, the, the question I have, you know, because a lot of times people associate funk rightly and or wrongly um, or narrowly, you know, as protest music. But as you know, you know, that's not like, you know, a central feature of what Rufus was about. So the question is, how is it that, you know, why, what was the appeal then? And that's when you got to get to her aesthetic. Right. And she was really kind of like, um, she used her voice as an instrument. I mean, she actually very, I mean, obviously singers, you know, use it for, but I mean, she really thought about jazz horn players, saxophones, right. Right. Charlie Parker, people like that. Um, and, you know, I, you, you, were, you mentioned that she did not grow up, you know, singing in church. So this isn't, you know, um, you know, her, her background. So, um, you know, I think the one of the ways to really explain, you know, how she develops, which I talk a little bit about in the book, is Guthrie Ramsey's concept of the community the theater. theaters. Yeah. And then, right. you know, she's able to sort of use these vernacular spaces to develop, you know, this sui generis sound, um, you know, and, you know, that, that she sort of, you know, is really a in a, a very astute uh, student of mm -hmm. music making, mm -hmm. you know, so she's actually paying attention to all these different, you know, basically the legacy legacy that she inherits, um, you know, in the city. Yeah, I, I remember the surprise, you know, when she did that one off album, Echoes of an Era, you know, where she's playing with all these top notch jazz musicians and, and, and folks are like, you know, I I didn't know, right? This right. this is not the chaka that we knew, right? But you know, it's kind of the part of chaka that there was no commercial space for her to be that, right? And you got a chance to hear it in that context. Yeah, good point. You know, yeah, she actually learned how to play drums. You know, people, you know, like you know, these are really, I think what you just said in terms of you know the the difficulty of categorizing her, which, you know, also happened uh, to Betty Davis and to, uh, right. and to Gil Scott Heron, um, you know. So, yeah, so th there was this, they had this sensibility that uh, I think that was at variance with uh, the status quo in a number of ways. You mentioned Gil and, you know, I, I've just finished watching the the National Geographic series of Aretha Franklin, Genius, sure. um, you know, which 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 is interesting in all kinds of ways. But I, I want to talk about the Clive Davis piece because um, he's featured in the last two episodes. <clears throat> and when I talk to, to younger folks, when I talk to students about, you know, first of all, who Clive Davis is and his relationship to Miles Davis and, and Sly and folks like that when he's at Columbia, talk about the Harvard report, but then talking about Arista Records, right? And, and, and I, you know, when I tell them, you know, the first act that he signed, the first Black act that he signs <laughs> is Gil Scott Heron. And, and because, you know, Gil Scott Heron is introduced to them as this godfather of hip hop. Yeah. Right. And, and, and they think right. about the spoken word piece. There's actually not a whole lot of ever conversation about Gil Scott Heron, the musician. Right. Yes. With or without Brian Jackson. Yes. Um, and, and I think that's part of what you recover here. This idea for obviously of, of a kind of bluesology, the term that he talked about all the time. But but to really double down on this idea 
idea of an organic intellectual is someone who feels what's happening in the culture with the people and brings musical language to that. Yeah, well, I think he epitomizes that in the term in the way that we understand it. Um, although he did earn an MA in creative writing, writing. you know, um, you know, had published two novels before <laughs> he was 23 years old. Um, but it, it, that's actually, you know, speaks to your, your point as the uh, organic intellectual, because he is someone who is sensitive to the time. And um, he realizes that in the best way, the most effective, you know, connection, um, you know, the one that really resonates with, you know, with people is music. And this is something, you know, he had, he had played in, you know, high school, you know, taking, you know, high school band and, and so forth. Um, so yeah, see, he was, he, he was, he was an organic intellectual in, in the most uh, comprehensive sense of the term, you know, um, you know, he, he thought about songwriting and, and poetry in, um, in fluctuating, in fluctuating senses. He, he would, he would call some things that we thought of as songs, like, you know, recordings, he would refer to those as poems and, and, and vice versa. Right. You know, so the, 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 the combination of talents that he had, I don't, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like that, at least in modern Black era. But all of this then is channeled through uh, music itself. You know, it's, it's not, so, so this is one, again, in terms of, you know, the universities and, and, and Black studies, you know, we talk about transdisciplinary studies today, right? But, you know, we generally don't, study the artist who exemplified this, you know, um, I mean, he's doing all of this long before <laughs> we thought of it. Right. <laughs> Interdisciplinary in ways that, you know, we didn't even have language to describe at the time. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to shift a little bit um, to think about some contemporary, one, a contemporary artist and also a contemporary performance. Um, and, you know, and many folks, particularly young folks, will hang their hat, you know, in thinking about funk in the 21st century and in this moment, they will hang their hat on a figure like uh, Bruno Mars, right? And, and of course, that happens in part because, you know, when you call a song Uptown Funk um, <laughs> and, and you gesture towards a tradition, um, you know, it, it gets read that way. But, you know, but when you think about contemporary artists, particularly young contemporary artists, who do you see now that is still really functioning within the tradition? of the type of funk that you lay out in this book? Hmm. Well, young folk might not call her. So, so I would, I think of Erica Badu, but yes. um, in terms of, you know, right now, um, this would, this is probably not going to sound, you know, sort of, you know, maybe counterintuitive, but uh, Jasmine Sullivan, in a way. In terms yeah. of her, yeah. just the craft and, um, you know, the kind of sincerity. For, for people who don't know, the word funk means sincerity. It means honesty, right? So, you know, in that, in that sense, um, you know, that's the best way I could come up of, you know, off the top of my head. Sorry about that. And, and, and how thrilled were you, if you got a chance to see it, were you to see uh, the Isley Brothers and Earth, Wind and Fire have the kind of platform that they had on verses, really to talk about their impact on American music. Oh man, I was, I didn't go to sleep until what? <laughs> I think it was like three o'clock in the morning. I was tweeting, you know, <laughs> out. No, but I, I, I think that, um, that this was really, you know, a great showcase and, um, 
I think it really demonstrated to people of a, a different generation. I mean, you could, you know, you could see what people were tweeting. Yeah, right. right? right. You know, and um, you know, they they weren't really aware of the fact that music could do this. You know, could have this kind of effect. Um, you know, and it, it, you know, sort of like you know, harvest for the world, for example. Um, now that is, it, it, in terms of the lyrics, obviously, you know, it, it's protest or it's political, but the music is so beautiful. So there's no real split between, right. you know, this sort of, you know, exhortation and the aesthetics. You, you even if you don't know the words, you're going to really respond to it, <laughs> right? You know, and so that is that the the, the function of very sort of foundational function of the music as a healing force that can do any number of other things as well. It can, can be straight up political, but you know, but they're gonna make sure they give you some eargasms that you can't resist. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, uh, the, one of the running jokes, you know, during the course of the night, you know, when Earth, Wind & Fire did Serpentine Fire, and of course, all the young folks are asking what a serpentine fire is, right? And, and then it got back to all those stories that even folks in the band asking Maurice, what's a serpentine fire? And it's like, and, and it gets back to the James Brown point, right? It, it's it's not a thing, it's a feeling. Yes. <laughs> right. You know, when, yes. when you hear it, you know, oh, that that's a serpentine fire. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> well, you know. That, again, feeling, you, 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 we have this idea, you know, that, that we have to be able to understand in abstract terms everything that, you know, is said. And, you know, um, there, are, there, 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 are, there are human phenomena that defy, you know, um, you know, these strict sort of frameworks and, you know, fun funk happens to be one in certain I, cases. I, I know it's bad form to ask what's next, particularly after you just dropped this beast of a book. Uh, but what is next for you, Tony? <laughs> well, okay. So I actually see this again as an aesthetic. So the book, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I was, I, you know, my PhD is in English. So I, I still love, love literature. I thought I was going to write a uh, basically a funk book about literature, about black writers. <laughs> and I realized no one had written about funk. Like I couldn't, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I, so that's why it took me so long. So I, I said, okay, I wanna write that book. That's right. because, you know, nobody's gonna believe me if I say this is an aesthetic and I'm not talking about, you know, the music. Funk music, and, right. You know, how you, you, okay, where's evidence? <laughs> so now I'm writing a book about, you know, the funk aesthetic, you know, uh, within the context of African American uh, literature. That's what this book is about. Thank you. We've been joined today by Professor Tony Bolden, who's professor of African American Studies at the University of Kansas. He's the author of Afro Blue, Improvisations in African American Poetry and Culture, University of Illinois Press, 2004, and the just published Groove Theory, The Blues Foundation of Funk, published by the University Press of Mississippi. It is so great to talk to you, brother. Thank you so much. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.